Hello, welcome to this uh, uh, continued lecture on an overview of English poetry. In the last class, we discussed uh, the origins of English poetry and uh, you know we discussed uh, the early English uh, poets and uh, through them we came to discuss uh, Chaucer and uh, we described Chaucer uh, as the first uh, major English poet or the father of uh, English poet and all that. So, now uh, in the second class uh, what we are going to deal with is discuss English poetry from uh, you know post uh, Chaucer's period to through metaphysical poetry you know. Uh, before we uh, uh, go to uh, Elizabethan poetry, the first halt for us after Chaucer is uh, John Skelton. You know. Historically, John Skelton uh, plays a major role, uh, especially for those of us who are interested in uh, political satire, how literature can be used as a kind of a political satire to ridicule the political structure and thereby you know critique it. Of course, the intention is uh, not just to ridicule, but to bring in positive changes in political power structures. And therefore, you know considering uh, Skelton's contribution to uh, this particular genre of writing, Erasmus uh, calls him the incomparable light and glory of English letters, the incomparable glory, light and glory of uh, English letters because uh, you know he mastered a particular genre of uh, English verse which is political satires. So, in his works uh, uh, you know he makes use of uh, uh, some kind of uh, contemporary allegories, political satires and ridicules you know established structures especially in his uh, book called A Ballad of the Scottish King. You know you can look at a kind of you know strange spellings, these are not uh, you know uh, misrepresentation of spellings that is how they were uh, originally spelt you know we must keep those things in mind you know that is how they were spelt English language has changed considerably since then, but this is how these words were spelt at that point of time you know. Uh, in fact, uh, Skelton's uh, contribution is also there in his uh, you know uh, use of a certain meters. In fact, now that is come to be called skeletonic meter you know. So, what does he do? Skeletonic meters are uh, you know are employed in verses which are short verses that have a kind of an irregular uh, meter, irregular meter used by the Tudor poet uh, John Skelton that is why they are called uh, skeletonic meters. So, that is also his contribution to uh, British uh, uh, English literature, English poetry as such. Uh, whenever uh, any work is used as a kind of a political satire you know uh, that belongs to uh, you know a protest genre of literature because the intention is uh, more than lampooning and ridiculing. Uh, here literature is used as a, a means of uh, protest, a site of uh, producing resistance and thereby marking your descent. So, therefore, skeleton becomes important for us because he uh, elevates uh, literature and po poetry especially uh, English poetry you know as a uh, literary site for protest you know as, as or as a note of descent. From skeleton let us move on to Elizabethan poetry. In fact, uh, for any uh, serious student of poetry especially serious student of uh, English poetry, Elizabethan poetry marks a kind of uh, you know a golden origin of uh, great poetry. We come face to face with uh, uh, such body of poetry which uh, excels on many fronts. Okay. So, Elizabethan poetry is, uh, is, is, is really very important for us. Uh, 
One of the remarkable features of Elizabethan poetry is the introduction of uh, the form of, uh, you know, sub form of poetry called sonnets. Of course, though sonnet was quite uh, popular in other parts of Europe, especially, you know, in, in Italy. So, it was for the first time introduced uh, into, you know, uh, English poetry here during the Elizabethan period. Therefore, uh, Elizabethan poetry marks the arrival of sonnet here. I do not need to introduce sonnets to you because in one of our earlier classes uh, we discussed sonnets uh, in great detail and even uh, you know in a quiz followed by uh, that class we discussed uh, there was a question you can recall right how do you distinguish a Petrarchan sonnet from a Shakespearean so sonnet and all that. So, generally a sonnet has 14 lines to that. Of course, we have also discussed exception to this 14 lines uh, rule. There are sonnets, uh, 12 line sonnets, they are called Kirtle sonnets and 16 line sonnets, Coda sonnets and all that we have discussed. Uh, here we need to remember that sonnets were introduced at this particular juncture of time. The credit of introducing uh, sonnets okay, into uh, the English soil goes to Sir Thomas Watt. So, you can call uh, uh, rightfully of course, him as the kind of uh, you know father of English sonnets, Sir Thomas Watt. Uh, because again of his exposure to other uh, uh, European literature, especially Italian literature. He also has translated a couple of uh, Petrarchan sonnets, but uh, uh, he has not just confined his uh, literary service there. He went on to contribute, uh, uh, you know, sonnets, original sonnets uh, to English poetry. Uh, his collection of uh, 96 love poems is called Total's Miscellany, that is his contribution to English poetry. Almost, uh, you know, it was posthumously published in 1557 after the poet's death, that is what you call posthumous publication is publication of something after the death of uh, the writer. Uh, and in this collection, you know, uh, about one third of them, you know, one third of them are you can call them sonnets, uh, and some of them are even translations from Petrarch. Uh, here, uh, until that point of time, you know, uh, sonnets were uh, they were slightly impersonal. So he has to his credit a adding a kind of a, a personal touch, a personal note to English poetry through sonnets that is something that has to be kept in mind. Uh, along with uh, Thomas Watt, Sir Thomas Watt, uh, Henry Howard has also played a major role in uh, introducing and popularizing uh, uh, the genre of sonnet or the subtype of genre. Therefore, uh, uh, they share a credit, a joint credit for introducing sonnets here. Uh, and what is remarkable here is, you know, we distinguished right, you know, Shakespearean sonnet uh, from Petrarchan sonnet. So, these two guys were the precursors of what can be called Shakespearean sonnet. In fact, uh, they were the ones who introduced uh, the variation, you know. Uh, the Petrarchan sonnet, if you recall, is uh, it, it, it consists of two stanzas. One is an octave, an eight line stanza and another one a sestet, a six lines one. Whereas, here it is, uh, you know, uh, three quatrains, uh, three stanzas of four line stanzas, you know, or uh, a four line stanza, three of them, four threes are twelve plus a couplet, you have a couplet. So, these two are uh, the precursors of uh, English sonnets or they can also be called later, they were uh, perfected by uh, an extraordinary literary figure the world has ever seen called Shakespeare, but more of Shakespeare in subsequent slides. Uh, before another stop before Shakespeare is uh, Sir Philip Sidney. Uh, Philip Sidney uh, occupied a major role, uh, especially for his uh, uh, critical work called Apology for Poetry. In fact, uh, 
uh, there has been uh, a kind of a debate between uh, uh, philosophy and poetry. Philosophers have pitted uh, uh, philosophy vis-a-vis uh, -vis poetry and have been uh, declaring philosophy as uh, a kind of a you know uh, better than poetry or something like that. But in uh, apology for poetry, Sydney almost you know champions the cause of poetry against philosophy. He scores a goal against uh, philosophy and champions the cause of poetry. So, that is his uh, contribution when it comes to uh, uh, you know is a literary critic as that is his contribution. But as a poet he has uh, you know a remarkable collection of sonnets you know love sonnets Astrophel and Stella you know that is uh, that is something that has to be kept in mind. From, Silip, uh, from Philip Sidney again uh, let us go to Edmund Spencer. Spencer too wrote uh, uh, sonnets, but of course uh, not predominantly sonnets were not so much uh, his preferred uh, uh, mode or medium of expression you know he wrote uh, poetry in other ways especially you know pastoral uh, poems somewhere you know in 1550s is uh, 1552 53 he was born. His remarkable contribution is the fairy queen it is a kind of a long allegorical poem you know a pastoral poem that uh, you know you find in which he introduces his own uh, particular type of stanza which later comes to be called Shakespearean stanza I am sorry a Spenserian stanza right. So, a Spenserian stanza I mean if you are really curious to know has 8 iambic pentameters, 8 iambic pentameter lines followed by a ninth line of 6 iambic feet. You know. So, that is a kind of a variation that uh, he brings in. So, he writes about uh, close to 90 Petrarchan sonnets and all that. Uh, from uh, Spencer, uh, let us go to Shakespeare. You know. Uh, probably uh, if we can uh, Shakespeare comes to occupy the pinnacle of uh, English literature. Why English literature alone any literature in the world? In fact, uh, the name of Shakespeare is almost synonymous with uh, you know extraordinary standards literary standards anywhere across the globe. So, he has uh, like you can replace literature with Shakespeare something like that. So, it is no it is uh, not an exaggeration if we say that there is nobody who is not aware of Shakespeare in the world of letters almost Shakespeare is the king something like that may be a hyperbole, but of course, if we have read his works you know it does not appear to be he is uh, you know uh, master of uh, you know drama. Uh, master of poetry, master of sonnets, an exemplary literary figure, uh, and his contribution to furthering English language is immense. Probably after the Bible, uh, Shakespeare must have uh, contributed lot many words, you know, to English language as such. Probably when it comes to individual, the highest contribution must have come uh, from uh, this great guy, William Shakespeare. That's why we say he needs no introduction to any. Uh, uh, any serious student of uh, literature. Of course, Shakespeare is well known for his plays, uh, he has about 40 plus plays uh, about let us say some of them are you know not all of them are available, but depending on whatever is available they are remarkable plays undoubtedly, but uh, maybe when we come to discuss uh, you know drama we may discuss Shakespeare in detail, but until that point of time our interest in Shakespeare is his contribution to poetry. Even if you take out his contribution to the world of uh, you know drama, Shakespeare na Shakespeare's name still stands out because we not many of us may be aware, but uh, he is an extraordinary poet. In fact, uh, even in his plays you know you find an abundant uh, and a rich uh, use of poetry. In fact, 
uh, you can even call that uh, his plays are a cornucopia of uh, rich imaginative poetry even there you know so he has uh, his to, uh, he has to his credit more than 150 sonnets and in fact these sonnets are again shrouded in uh, mystery like the very personality of Shakespeare which is shrouded in mystery. In fact, many believe that you know probably Shakespeare may be a pseudonym for some other writer. Many of them have even gone on to even allude that uh, there was nobody called Shakespeare during that time. You know Shakespeare might have been a pen name or a kind of a pseudonym. Uh, it must be some other uh, character, maybe it may be Bacon, uh, you know all those kind of allusions have come. Let us leave these debates aside, you know, let us leave these debates aside. Even his sonnets are shrouded in mystery because, you know, uh, they are dedicated to, you know, a mysterious person called Mr. W. H. They are just, uh, you know, dedicated to uh, a person uh, and who is identified by his initials, you know, W and H. Again, there are a lot of theories concerning who this W H is, you know, is he a patron of Shakespeare, is he a friend of Shakespeare and you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, discussions around that equation between that particular person and Shakespeare and all that, we are not going into all that non-literary discussion. Uh, he has, uh, uh, you know, dedicated most of these sonnets to this particular friend, friend and patron and about uh, 20 five and odd uh, sonnets to a kind of again another mysterious dark lady, maybe his lady love, maybe again you know uh, a lady patron we do not know uh, you know to uh, a dark lady. It has been dedicated to dark lady about uh, 25 or 28 odd ones about 155 out of them you know majority of them dedicated to a mysterious friend W H and another 20 odd uh, sonnets to. Uh, a dark lady. Okay. If you look at uh, these sonnets, they are you know an extraordinary contribution that is precisely what I was saying. Even if you take away all the plays that are attributed to Shakespeare, Shakespeare's name would still be written in the golden letters because of his uh, sonnets. These sonnets exemplify uh, you know, uh, the writer's uh, imagination, creativity, their perspective towards life, their literary uh, craftsmanship, the use of language, the use of diction. Take up any measure, any standard, these uh, sonnets uh, stand out, you know. Well, in order to give you a glimpse of uh, the quality of these sonnets, let us uh, directly delve into these uh, sonnets themselves, but more apart from these sonnets he also has to his credit uh, other uh, poems called uh, you know Venus and Adonis, remarkable uh, you know piece and the rape of Lucris, a kind of a satire, uh, but still an important contribution to poetry. So, here we have with us uh, a beautiful uh, sonnet you know. And uh, when we read the sonnet, uh, well, uh, what you can also do, you can uh, uh, note down some of the predominant figures of speech employed here and uh, thereby you can also enhance uh, your understanding of uh, figures of speech, you know. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, you are more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May and summer's lease is all too short a date. Again, please go on noting down the rhyme scheme because you know his sonnets are a kind of a rich uh, sources for any student of uh, literature. You can study it from their structural perspective, from their creative perspective, you know, from the perspective of figures of speech employed there, from the perspective of uh, a rich, uh, uh, you know. Uh, a, a, a rich way of life presented in them, all these things, you know. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May and summer's lease has all too short a date. Sometime 
Too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. But your eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair though owes, nor shall death brag you wanderers in a shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. You know, so these lines are used symbolically or metaphorically, figuratively, in order to uh, uh, capture, you know, how you can make, uh, you know, a, a mortal being immortal. So, this is where probably, you know, uh, mortal beings can claim victory over death. How? Because when their names are etched in literature, you know, when their names are etched in literature, as long as literature lives, their name also lives, you know, their person, that person also lives. So, this is one way of conquering death. So, he is saying to the person he addresses, he says, it is true you are beautiful, you are more beautiful than, uh, you know, this, you are more beautiful than that, you know. But what I can make you, uh, well, after a certain time, you know, this beauty that you are so proud of may vanish. And I have a way to make it immortal. How do I make it? When I put your name in my sonnets, you know, I am going to make you immortal. Look at uh, the conf confidence of the writer. Look at how beautifully the writer and confidently declares that, you know, he is going to make that person immortal. And how prophetic that was, you know. Had it not been, you know, if it were not for the reference in these kind of sonnets, we would not even have read about uh, that person today, because history has witnessed so many beautiful people, so many, you know, handsome people. So, not all of them are recalled, except during their lifetime and especially except uh, by those that are around those people. No one else remembers them, right? But now, because of the sonnet, all of us uh, at least for some time come to scratch our head about the beauty of this lady or beauty of this person, right. So, this is the power of uh, literature that it can, uh, you know, make human beings immortal. Uh, so, this is uh, something that has to be kept in mind. From uh, Shakespeare's sonnet, I have another sonnet again for want of time, I am not uh, reading it. Again, it is a uh, this particular sonnet is, uh, you know, dense. It, uh, I mean, it's uh, dense in the sense that it makes use of uh, dense similes. It, it, if there is one poem that stands out for using simile, it's a direct comparison, right? My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. So he goes on directly comparing, uh, you know, the so-called dark lady to very many objects, natural objects, direct comparison. So, this poem exemplifies the use of a simile. You can take a look at this poem, you know, it is uh, called sonnet number 130. 130. Uh, from uh, Shakespeare, we move on to uh, John Milton. Again, Milton is a, a kind of a, an iconoclastic name when it comes to English poetry. Uh, Milton, after a while, loses sight of, uh, you know, loses his sight, you know, he cannot see. Nevertheless, he continues writing poetry, he continues uh, writing uh, his service to literature, especially his poem, you know, On His Blindness is an extraordinary uh, uh, poem, a short poem, you know. He says, uh, you know, now imagine what happens, what, what would be the plight of a writer, you know, who has relayed on his eyes to see and write, all of a sudden if he loses sight of his eyes, what happens to the person? What happens to the person? How can he read? It is like uh, weaning him away from the very source of life, right? So, during those desperate times, he writes that particular poem on his blindness and that is where you come across these immortal lines, you know, those lines that are, you know, a kind of a treasure house for uh, any optimist. He says, you know, uh, they also serve who only stand and wait. Uh, 
you do not need to he says that uh, I have lost my eyes, how do I serve God, I cannot do anything. Then towards the end of that particular poem he says, they also serve who only stand and wait because probably it is at kind of a testing time. So, if we can learn to be patient without complaining, if we can endure even that and gracefully you know weather those that kind of pressure you know it is kind of grace under pressure if we can maintain that it is also another kind of service to God these remarkable lines you know. His uh, contribution to English literature is uh, immense especially through his uh, Paradise Lost and uh, Paradise Regained. These are two of his uh, immortal works, uh, greatest epics in fact these are modern epics, uh, these are great epics in English literature and uh, they establish uh, his preeminent position in English poetry these works. From John Milton uh, we move on to metaphysical poetry in fact uh, uh, with a discussion of metaphysical poetry we are going to uh, uh, end this class and maybe in the next class uh, we are going to take up a discussion of uh, English poetry post metaphysical poetry until it is uh, modern uh, practice modernist poetry. Uh, Metaphysical poetry is a kind of a revolutionary poetry, it is a kind of a welcome deviation from the neoclassical poetry practiced uh, during uh, the Miltonic times you know be it in terms of uh, you know the subject matter, the use of language, uh, the use of diction and their attitude towards life it is uh, totally revolutionary. And interestingly uh, metaphysical poetry can be called a kind of an equivalent of uh, bhakti poetry in the Indian context because you know like uh, bhakti poetry is revolutionary in uh, very many ways, metaphysical poetry is also revolutionary. It is uh, it's religious but not in a conventional sense of the term, not in a conventional sense of the term you know. So, through their ingenious use of uh, conceits, irony and uh, uh, metrical compositions or flexibility in the way they compose it, uh, it brings in a kind of a whiff of fresh uh, air into English poetry. Uh, one of the remarkable traits of metaphysical poetry is their use of uh, conceit, a, a, a specialized uh, literary device, uh, figure of speech called uh, conceit. So, in conceit it is a comparison, well remember when it comes to comparison you have simile and metaphor, but conceal is a kind of a strange comparison. When uh, you look at uh, a conceit you will be surprised until you read the entire poem you do not know on what basis the poet is comparing one with the other. For instance, uh, the poet compares John Donne who is uh, probably one of the quintessential metaphysical poets you know, uh, compares uh, lovers to a pair of compass. He compares lovers to a pair of compass, that geometrical box that you find that compass. Why does he compare, what are the grounds for comparison? It may sound strange, but when you read it you realize that you know it is with the help of this literary device uh, you know he, uh, he almost uh, you know fuses to disparate dissimilar things. It is like you know there is a definition one of the definitions of conceit uh, is this that uh, two objects are violently yoked together probably it is uh, Johnson who says it or maybe some other uh, literary critic. Two disparate objects are violently yoked together, uh, but uh, not because of course there is no scope for a natural comparison. But when you complete reading the poem, you understand the beauty of that comparison all the more. So that's uh, metaphysical. That's a quintessential trait of uh, metaphysical poetry. All right. Some of the well-known practitioners of uh, this particular movement of poetry or genre of poetry uh, are John Donne, George Herbert, you know Andrew Marvell, Abraham Cowley, Richard Crashaw, Henry Vaughan and others. Uh, if you have uh, read this poem called The Pulley, you know there is a beautiful poem called The Pulley. Uh, 
uh, again a very important uh, uh, metaphysical poem. He compares uh, uh, you know uh, stress, the poet compares stress, the pressure that we have, anxiety that we have, the stress that we face in human life to pulley you know like the pulley is used as a kind of a you know leverage to push something ahead. He says anxiety, sorrow or uh, lack of happiness, God uses these qualities as a pulley you know so that using them God pushes us towards him you know he, he pushes uh, human beings towards himself you know he uses them as a kind of a leverage a very interesting uh, conceit that the poet uses. And one of the remarkable traits of metaphysical poetry is a kind of a, a, a dramatic beginning, more than dramatic, it is a kind of a shocking beginning. Right in the very first line, the poet makes the reader, you know, sit tight, you know, sit up and tight and uh, read it. Now, look at this, death be not proud, though some have called you mighty and dreadful, for you are not so look at the kind of a, a dramatic challenge, death you be not proud, many have called you uh, you know mighty and dreadful, of course rightly right, because death is called the great leveler, uh, a great equalizing force, whatever may be, we may be during our life, a king, queen, you know an ordinary person, a clerk, a pure, slave, whatever this may be during our roles on this planet death brings an end to all of us that is why it is called the great leveler you know. So, therefore, it is called very mighty, but now look at the challenge the poet here challenges death and says do not be so proud you that you are powerful in fact, you are definitely not powerful I can defeat you, I can defeat you something like that and the rest of the poem explains why death should not be proud and how you score over death something like that. Similarly, that is a kind of a shocking uh, you know challenge and uh, a shocking beginning. Similarly, you also have another poem called uh, you know the sun rising, the sun rising and here again he says uh, sun, he, it is a direct challenge to the sun, he says sun do not be so proud you know I can eclipse you in the blink of an eye I can eclipse you. Now, look how beautiful right, how beautiful you know what happens many say sun is all powerful and all that, but when you close your eyes you are going to I mean at least metaphorically it, it appears as if you are eclipsing sun at least from your perspective right. So, this is uh, metaphysical poetry in a nutshell for us you know shocking beginning use of uh, strange comparisons, uh, unconventional tone, unconventional diction. And strangely uh, most of these practitioners are uh, I mean they have a religious background, they have religious background. So, you can call metaphysical poetry a kind of an equivalent of uh, uh, bhakti poetry in the Indian context. Before I end I am sure you enjoyed this lecture as well. Uh, we began our discussion of this class with uh, you know uh, from middle English uh, uh, poetry onwards we discussed uh, you know precursors of uh, Shakespeare and introduction of sonnet, uh, sonnet here, uh, Philip Sidney's defense of poetry and then we discussed the greatness of Shakespeare, we even read uh, some interesting sonnets by Shakespeare and now of course, we are ending this with a discussion of uh, metaphysical poetry, John Donne and some interesting uh, comparisons and poetic techniques uh, used here. Okay. So, in the next class uh, we would uh, complete our discussion of uh, you know an overview of uh, English poetry. So, beginning with the origins we have come up to you know metaphysical poetry. So, in the next class uh, we are going to you know complete our understanding of an overview of uh, English poetry alright until then take care thank you.